Hey everyone, welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together and solo and all things Beatles related as well. I'm Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. WFUV is a non-commercial public radio station and we broadcast at 90.7 FM, 90.7 FM HD2 as well. And you can listen online anywhere. You don't have to be in the tri-state area to listen at 90.7 FM. You could stream us wherever you are at WFUV.org. You could get our app and listen to us there, or even ask your smart speaker to play WFUV. Um, I've been on the air at WFUV now. It's going to be 38 years at the end of the month, Uh, and uh, it's a thrill to be here every couple of weeks with my good friends, Ken Michaels, longtime radio personality who has dedicated uh, almost his entire 40 some odd year broadcasting career to uh, Beatles oriented programs. Mm -hmm. Um, Ken spent some time behind the mics at XM Satellite Radio. Uh, At the moment, he hosts a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing and is also part of the video cast Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, ladies and gentlemen, Ken Michaels. Thank you, Darren. A pleasure to be here. Hi, and Darren. Ken. Hi, Alan. Ken. <laughs> and that's Alan Cozen, the acclaimed writer, journalist, music critic. He's also spent some 40 odd years uh, writing. He spent a lot of time at the New York Times writing about classical music and, of course, the Beatles. And uh, in recent years, has contributed to the Wall Street Journal and, and other publications as well. He has a bunch of books under his belt, including The Beatles, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. Uh, And he's written about classical music, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome Alan Cozen. Why, thank you, Darren. Hello, everyone. Hello, Ken. And before we move into the topic uh, for today's show, which I might add is my topic, I shouldn't have been so proud of that because if it ends up being a dud of a show everyone's going to go good idea DeVivo (laughs) which is what Ken has said already once but no I haven't no I'm kidding kidding. uh but anyway uh before we get into the show itself and the topic uh it is news time with Ken Michaels well we've actually got quite a bit of news and we're going to start with a news item that for many of you this will be the first time you're hearing it And I got to tell you, this is the most exciting news of the week for me. Um, And I want to thank one of our listeners, viewers, Matt Wilsinski, for letting us know it is now listed on IMDb, Paul McCartney's long-awaited animated film, High in the Clouds, is expected in 2022. It's coming to Netflix. Last I heard, Paul had recorded nine songs for the film one of which uh, has Lady Gaga on it. Keep your fingers crossed for it finally coming out this year. Doesn't give you the the exact date, but uh, I'm really psyched about this because we've been hearing about this for so long. As you probably know, animated films take a long time to get finished. And after what Paul went through with Rupert the Bear, he wanted to make a full-length feature film, which didn't happen. Instead, he ended up making the short for Rupert and the Frog Song, and he made a few other really good animated shorts. But it looks like High in the Clouds was coming out this year on Netflix. So again, thank you, Matt, for that information. Um, As most of you know, the Beatles' Apple rooftop performance was just shown in IMAX theaters on January 30th, the actual anniversary, the 53rd anniversary, which also included a Q&A from Peter Jackson, I know Darren went to see it in New York City. I saw it in New Jersey. Alan, did you attend any of the no, screenings? No, okay. The nearest one is in Massachusetts somewhere. Well, let me find out from you, first of all, Darren, what you thought. Um, I actually, without getting into non, a non beetle related topic, was a little hesitant uh, to you know, go into a packed movie theater, but I figured you know, it's a one hour presentation and you know, it's the Beatles, you know, so I, I can, I can tell you that wearing two K95 masks at the same time 
It mm. is difficult to breathe. And if you haven't properly brushed your teeth before you put them on, you will gas yourself. And uh, so that was um, part of my day. But no, seriously, <laughs> uh, the movie was a thrill. Um, I mean, I was excited the minute I sat down and they're showing all these still photographs from the movie on the screen uh, and playing someone else's music. But they were showing stills from Get Back uh, leading up to the beginning of the uh, of the Q&A, which was first. Right. And I was and surprised. I didn't, my, I didn't look at my clock, but I think that they were fairly close to four o'clock on the dot. Uh, that they got started and they had a host. I don't know who it was. Do you know who the, the host was? I didn't write his name down. No. Yeah, they had a host um, uh, in London at the IMAX theater in London or an IMAX theater in London where they were showing uh, the rooftop performance and he was like the host. And then they clicked to uh, the satellite feed and there was Peter Jackson um, in New Zealand and basically talking about the movie and fielding questions and talking about the rooftop. And if you've seen our interview uh, here on Things We Said Today, uh, it was almost like, well, it was like in a way taking a four hour conversation and crushing it down to 20 minutes or so, because he did kind of quickly touch on some points that he made with us. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was very interesting that he pulled out his iPad like he did um, right. on our show and we're showing stuff to the folks uh, in the IMAX theaters. It was very interesting how we were showing how all the cameras were um, synchronized and how they picked shots for the rooftop performance. There was something like 13 cameras, I think he said. No, 10. 10? But you got uh, to see all of them on screen. I'm sorry? You got to see all 10 cameras. Yeah, he held up screen. his yeah. iPad yeah. and it, was, it had each camera, a hmm. little box marked off each camera and right. you could see where the cameras would, this one was turned on and you'd see a zoom in on Paul, that camera would go on, mm. on the crowd, Paul go off, two other cameras would go on and it would all have the same soundtrack playing underneath it. Right. And they basically watched all this and I guess they cherry picked, all right, Paul here, crowd here, close up on Ringo here, we'll do a split screen and bring those images together because the cameras weren't naturally all rolling at the same time. Uh, and that was very interesting. And that was something that that uh, Peter Jackson did with his uh, via his iPad. And he did allude to the fact this was before we got the announcement that we're going to get to in a in a few minutes. Um, the DVD Blu-ray was still on the table for February 8th release. Um, and he talked, he mentioned that it would be nice if there was more stuff on there. And if you want more stuff on there right to Disney, call Disney, knock on Disney's doors mm. uh, and uh, let them know that you want more. Um, he did bring out, do I have my notes? I probably, Mr. Organization here can never find anything. Um, I did make uh, some notes that are not on my iPad, but they're on my phone. So much for the cloud. Um, because he did talk about towards the end of the session, um, uh, he made mention about uh, the possibilities of maybe Let It Be. If Let It Be were to get reissued, that could be the place where the extra material mm -hmm. um, could be could be could be placed as extras on the reissue if it happens of Michael Lindsay Hogg's original movie. And he made it a point to say every sounds like every second of all the films that exist and and audio has been remastered so it's ready to go you know wherever it ends up if it comes out mm -hmm. you know. but i think that's the notes i made for myself was that he did specifically bring up the possibility of let it be coming out and that could be the place for um you know for these extras he and also yeah, until yes. now we didn't think of it as a possibility. It was told to us when they originally announced Peter Jackson's involvement with the new project that it was going to happen. So when he says, if, what does that mean? Does that mean they're thinking of not doing it now? Uh, he was, he didn't definitely say let it be would come out. 
he was a little kind of talked, right? Interesting. Yeah, I don't remember him saying if. I do remember him saying that um, even though we know that there's a rough cut that he made of Get Back, which is 18 hours, I believe, he said there should be, there's another three to four hours that really should be shown. And he was kind of pushing for that. Right. So, yeah, and he was encouraging people to write into Disney and see what they can do. And maybe if we drum up enough support, that might change the release or however, it, however any extra footage gets out there. But um, yeah, I, I was um, very pleased with everything. First of all, the sound in the theater was great of the, of the Apple rooftop concert. Um, I was under the impression that it was gonna be more of a surround sound kind of thing. And I only heard sound from the front and the sides, but it really was very clear. And it's just great to see it on the big screen. But um, with the Q&A, there was something that, that Peter said that really caught me by surprise. And I'm gonna to have to ask Alan about this because for some reason he brought up that there's two to three hours of film footage from the Beatles White Album sessions. Now, apart from what we've seen of Paul doing Blackbird in the studio and the Beatles rehearsing Hey Jude, what else is there? <laughs> Do you know? But I don't even know why it was necessary for him to bring that up but that really caught me you know by surprise to hear that there was and we're going to talk about hey bulldog coming up there was a session early in 68 oh. where they were supposed to be doing i guess filming for uh, a video from lady madonna and that's where that hey bulldog hey bulldog footage comes from and maybe they maybe that's part or all of it maybe I think Peter knows enough about their sessions to not confuse that with the White Album. So if he said that there's a lot of White Album stuff, he probably, mm. you know, I mean, look, we've seen the little bit of Paul doing Blackbird and Helter Skelter, but, you know, I'm sure someone didn't just come in and take three minutes of film. There must be, you know, quite a bunch because they were making that Apple promo film. Um, and they were filming all mm. kinds of stuff. I mean, there's also the meeting with Lou Grade, uh, great Dick James. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, the, and, and Alex in his studio, I wonder what other film there is of that. Um, so, you know, all the stuff that that promo is made from, you know, the, the raw materials must be out there and she probably has seen them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, just that just sort of like really caught me by surprise when he said that. And I, I certainly don't. I, whenever I think of like Hey Jude or Lady Madonna, despite the fact that they were on the White Album box set, you know, the White Album sessions to me were separate. You know, that's how I look at it. Um, yeah. yeah. What did you think of the sound, Darren? Um. It was excellent, but I was expecting it in, uh, you know, in a large IMAX theater in, in, in Manhattan. Um, I, I didn't hear anything that was like any oh wow moments to the uh, to the sound. Um, I thought it was outstanding. It would, you know, it was it was and it was it was powerful. It even got, you know, on occasion, slightly loud um, and it was great. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was more. Uh, really into uh, examining, you know, uh, the instruments, uh, the amps, the equipment, how they rigged up the roof, the logistics of the whole thing. And I still can't help but get so excited when I hear them performing a song or a part of a song that made it onto the album, you know, and, you know, the full start, for example, to I Dig a Pony, um, you know, from when I was five years old, I've been hearing this on, on the out on Let It Be. And now I'm sitting there in this big movie theater, 53, you know, 53 years later. And there's I, I saw the false start, how it happened. It was it was Ringo calling out. He was making an adjustment to his symbol. That thing. And we talked about I talked about this when we saw it on uh, Disney Plus, the whole uh, the whole documentary. That stuff really excites me when I'm actually seeing 
the recordings of the songs that I've been listening to from when I was little happening right before my eyes after all these years. Mm. Um, um, I'm trying to think if there was anything else that jumped out at me. I was trying to remember if, uh, and, and I couldn't, and I haven't had a chance to go back and watch Get Back Again, at least the end of it. Um, in the rooftop concert film that was in the IMAX theaters, they did include the last day of the sessions back downstairs in Apple yes. Studios. And then at the end, the credits rolled. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't for the life of me remember if that was trimmed or if that was the way the whole documentary ends, the full footage of that Peter gave us of the last day downstairs in Apple. Okay. It's my impression that, that a lot of it is new, that wasn't in the Get Back documentary. You saw part of Two of Us and part of Let It Be and part of The Long and Windy Road and other stuff from those sessions. A lot of it was edited, a lot of, you know, funny lines coming from John, you know, um, all edited together very well, just like it was in the documentary. But um, what I'm saying is, it was it exactly? Was it just I don't know. Lifted out to... in, in its entire. I couldn't tell, and I didn't have a chance to watch again. Like I say, on Disney Plus to see if if it was simply you know a cut made at the beginning of the rooftop performance right through to the credits ending, mm. um, completely whole as it appeared in the full documentary. He did add on the uh, introduction that started the whole thing. The, like, I don't think it's about maybe close to 10 minutes long introduction on how the Beatles got to where they were mm -hmm. in January 69, starting with the Quarrymen. Uh, that introduction was at the beginning of uh, the rooftop concert, um, which was fun. Did you get your, did you get your swag, your, your promo, uh, your merch, your free merch? This is my poster. We both have right here. Yeah. And I've got, where is it? My laminate. Hey, if I Everybody knew there was swag, I'd have driven to Massachusetts. <laughs> I didn't know ahead of time. And you had a blizzard that eat. day, however. <laughs> and there's a card that they give you, which apparently entitles you to 10% off in the Beatles store when you go online. And it's good for uh, until July 1st right here hey look my card's defective it's backwards <laughs> i'm covering it, it shows you. forwards to us mm. oh it does yep how about now, <laughs> now it shows um, <clears throat> i i was i was going to make a joke that on the back of these was a uh, ten dollars off uh mcdonald's french fries <laughs> um but anyway, I thought it was, I had a feeling we were going to get like a poster or something. I was hoping at least mm -hmm. uh, that we would get uh, some goodies. And uh, all in all, I'm, I'm so happy I, I went and decided, all right, I'm going to, the hermit's going to leave his house and, uh, and go out into the uh, wild coronavirus tundra out there. Mm. I'm very happy I did it. It was very much worth the while. And it's, it's going to, the rooftop concert's going to be showing, not necessarily in IMAX. Right. Uh, you will have a chance. Sorry. You will mm. have a chance to see it uh, in theaters um, this month. February 11th, 12th, and 13th. Select movie theaters. But I'd just like to add a couple of things. First of all, and I don't want to sound like a broken record here, but I was really hoping that this concert would be just the Beatles on the rooftop, not people on the street not the policeman entering the Apple building, but it was exactly the same as it was in the documentary. I love that, all that footage, though. You could still hear them. I, I, know know what I know what you're saying. I know what everyone's saying. But it just, I don't know, that just adds, I don't know, just a certain uh, flavor to the whole experience. Like, you're really there. You're not just watching the performance, but you're with them. You're there. I you're understand seeing what's happening in the street. I it didn't take away from. I thought Peter Jackson handled it perfectly. He could have probably overdone it with the man in the street interviews, uh, but he handled. I thought he handled it perfectly the way he put it together. 
Um, and, uh, you know, the scenes in the lobby can, can be pretty comical. Uh, um, you know, the, the Bobbies waiting and waiting and waiting and boom, the Beatles go into another song. Right. You know, and they're waiting to shut the whole thing down and bing, here comes another song. And they People. think that they're in the building. No, they're on the roof. They're on the roof. <laughs> what are they doing on the roof? Um, and does anyone know the whereabouts? Who's the doorman? Jimmy? I got to look it up. I, I'm picturing him. Yeah, where head. is he today? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, don't get me wrong. I think the way it was handled in the documentary was brilliant. I love all the different shots at the same time, the split screen that was handled. You know, it's it's perfect for a documentary, but considering the historic importance of this concert, I would have loved to have just seen the band and everybody else on the rooftop and right. nobody else. Mm -hmm. This is separate from the documentary to me. This is just the rooftop concert. What he did belongs to the documentary, but I don't see why we can't just get the four okay. Beatles and everybody else. And uh, I, I will also say there was added footage of the Beatles in the basement at Apple after the concert. And I'm telling you, they looked exhilarated. Okay, wait, you know, you just said extra footage. There was some stuff there that wasn't in the full movie. Right. I'm talking about what was in the basement right after but the concert. After they, they went down to listen back to the... Yeah. to listen to the playback of the concert. Right. And it, it, so I was I was right. I sensed that the post concert part of the movie seemed a little different. Yeah. Than, that, than, yeah. OK. But okay. when you're talking about the next day, January no, 31st, all right. yeah, that's what I thought you meant. I was I basically meant the whole part of uh, the rooftop concert once the roof was done. Uh, and they go downstairs. From that point of the film on, there was some little, there was some additional stuff there, not in the eight hours. Right. So, And I could swear, because yeah. it all went by so fast, I wish I could just rewind it and, and play it back. But Paul said something to the effect of, you know, we should be doing concerts on different rooftops, you know, at different locations. He enjoyed yeah. it so much. Yeah. He said it very quickly. So, um, but the looks on all their faces, they were all smiling and having such a good time. You know, for all that we've heard, especially from John and George, that these were, you know, the most miserable sessions on earth. Maybe there are certain memories that they have that we haven't seen, but they certainly had some good times during yeah. those sessions. There's no doubt about it. And I think they really got a jolt out of that rooftop concert. I think it goes back to what we were talking about a couple of years ago when the White Album box came out, when they were making music, when they were in the studio, when they're behind the mics, uh, all the problems that they were dealing with, whether collective problems or personal problems would go away. Hmm. And they were able to be four brothers making music again. That's you what know, Ringo has said. For that, you walk out of that, com that comfort zone, you know, hmm. Because you, know, right. you do watch them and you're like, this band essentially broke up nine months later? Really? Because these guys don't look like they're breaking up. But they had about another nine, what, right? Matt's involved. I think they didn't tell me Matt's involved. In it. About nine months, right? Well, it's September yeah, when John made the announcement. No, was I'm it, talking about I mean, when... it, it, it's 12 months to the next January and then they broke up in April. So, right. well, this is one John said, uh, you know, in the meeting that he wanted a divorce. Hmm. That was in the fall. That was in September. OK, yeah. 69. I and really, mean. I always thought that for the most part, they kind of all went in their own hmm. respective corners after that. And other than the brief session they had at the beginning of 70, that really was it for them. That was really when it ended. That meeting, that 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 statement from uh, from John, Jimmy mm -hmm. Clark, the doorman. Okay. Yeah, where are you, Jimmy Clark? We'd love to have you on the show. Mm. <laughs> All right, but it was still a very enjoyable experience, you know. Mm. 
And I, I'd have to say thank you to Peter Jackson for putting this extra stuff in there. He snuck that in there. He's finding ways to get this extra material out without people knowing about it beforehand, I think. His next movie, which will be the prequel to The Hobbit, is going to open up with outtakes from um, one of the uh, I Me Mine bits. Uh, and you're going to wonder, how did the Beatles end up in Hobbit land? Hmm. There's a little humor. It's... Very, <laughs> very little. Let's get on with some more news. And there's still, still quite a lot news? to talk about here. Oh, believe me. There was the announcement that the actual performance on the Apple rooftop is now available on streaming platforms. And there will be a number of celebrations going on surrounding the Apple rooftop concert, including the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame announcing a new exhibit that will open on March the 18th, promised to transport us back in time to the January 1969 sessions with large scale audiovisual displays and a treasure trove of memorabilia on loan from the Beatles themselves. And these include original instruments, handwritten lyrics, articles of clothing ranging from Ringo's red raincoat that he wore on the rooftop, George Harrison's very ultra modern pinstripe suit and John's granny glasses. Also, Nora Jones just played tribute by having two performances of songs from that time, which she performed on top of the Empire State Building. And she put that on her own YouTube channel, those of I've Got a Feeling and Let It Be. The uh, Cirque du Soleil performance troupe for the Beatles show Love debuted a rooftop performance video of their own to a version of Get Back with their own special mix for the song. And uh, the Nora Jones and Love performances, I should say, can also be seen on the Beatles' own website, thebeatles.com. And there was also a rooftop concert special on Sirius XM's Beatles channel with Beatles historian, author, and radio producer Kevin Howlett doing a commentary. So a lot going on right now where that's concerned. However, some rather upsetting news concerning the release of Get Back, the DVD and Blu-ray, which was set for February 8th. There will be a delay in its release. The official, the Beatles official store sent out an email to those that ordered it saying there were technical and supply chain issues. We do not have an exact date for its new release yet. And it may interest many of our listeners that a new petition has been started to get Disney to release an extended version of Get Back. And maybe this delay in the release might make a difference here in this regard. And Alan, you were telling me that um, Andrew Dixon, who does his own Beatles YouTube channel, uh, posted a whole bunch of links where people can write to about this. Yeah. Um, in uh, the description box for this show that you're watching now, I don't know if, if people sometimes don't read the description box, I'm going to put um, the link to the petition and also um, the various uh, email addresses and uh, Twitter addresses, things like that, that um, Andrew Dixon has provided in his podcast. Um, so we might as well, you know, the more the merrier, everyone on the planet should write in and say that we want more stuff uh, in an extended version. Definitely. How about a 60 hour version? Hmm. Yeah, all of it. <laughs> you want it all. <laughs> And Andrew does great work, by the way. I've watched a lot of his videos. Does fine work on the Beatles. Um, other news, there will be a brand new documentary called The Beatles and India, which will be streaming exclusively on BritBox in North America. Starting on February the 15th, BritBox is the streaming service from BBC Studios and ITV, offering the largest collection of British TV. This documentary examines how Indian music and culture shaped the music of John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and in turn, explores how the Beatles served as ambassadors of this pioneering world music sound and cultural movement. It draws together an expansive archive of footage, including contemporaneous local uh, shooting in India, also recordings, photographs, and compelling firsthand interviews, and it was awarded Best Film Audience Choice and Best Music at the 2021 UK Asian Film Festival called Tongues on Fire. 
In addition to that, Silva Screen Records, that's S-I-L-V-A, Silva Screen Records, in tandem with the documentary, will be releasing a 19-track uh, companion album, The Beatles in India, Songs Inspired by the Film, featuring wondrous interpretations of the Beatles songbook, blending traditional and contemporary Indian influences as recorded and performed by Indian artists like Anushka Shankar, who's on there. All right. Uh, from one of my primary news sources, right here, Darren DeVivo. I have learned that Ringo is helping out his fellow all-star Colin Hay with his new album coming out on March 18th called Now and the Evermore. Ringo drums on the title track. And Colin will be doing a U.S. tour from March 18th to April 7th before raring to go with Ringo's All-Stars in June. Another release on March 18th. Everything is happening on March 18th. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame exhibit opens March 18th. There's a new album coming from Ray Wiley Hubbard called Co-Starring 2, T-O-O, which will have Ringo drumming on one track as well. His other friends get by with a little help from Ringo. Also, news from Darren, new Mary Hopkins CD has just been released. That's called Pieces. You can order the album at uh, maryhopkin.bandcamp.com. In addition to all that, there's a brand new cover version of Paul McCartney's song, On the Wings of a Nightingale which he first gave to the Everly Brothers for their comeback album, EB84. The new version comes from the Whitmore Sisters from their new album called Ghost Stories. The two women, Eleanor and younger sister Bonnie, have had busy solo careers, and it took the pandemic to get them to make their first record together. Their harmonies are actually exquisite, and you can actually listen to this on YouTube. That's the Whitmore Sisters, W-H-I-T-M-O-R-E. And just a couple more news items. News came out last week. This is kind of unusual. It will be for many of us. About an auction of Julian Lennon's own personal memorabilia. It's called an, F, uh, an NFT auction. NFT means non-fungible -fung token. Non-fungible means something that is unique and can't be replaced. He's offering Beatles and John Lennon items but not to own them physically. Each item is offered as an audio visual collectible with a narration from Julian. Among the items you can bid on are handwritten notes about the song Hey Jude from Paul McCartney, the Afghan coat that John wore in Magical Mystery Tour, the black cape that John wore in Help, also three different Gibson guitars gifted by John to Julian. The bidding actually started last week, January 24th, and runs through February the 7th at 10 a.m. Pacific time in Beverly Hills and live online at juliansauctions.com. They're even accepting cryptocurrencies. Uh, proceeds from the sales will benefit Julian's charity called the White Feather Foundation. Uh, one other thing to add about Julian, in one interview that he gave recently, he indicated that he will have a new album out this year, oh, which good. is great news. Very different type of auction. I, I don't mean, listen, I have <laughs> a jar of pennies upstairs. I don't know what this cryptocurrency thing is all about. <laughs> and when you said NFT, is it's a fungus? Non-fungible or fungible? Oh, non-fungible. Fungible. See, that's, see, that's, they make cream for that. You know what I mean? If you get a non-fungible, you get a little cream. So it, essentially what we have here are photographs of these items. It looks like it. it's photographs or, or a video of some kind with narration from Julian. The impression that I get, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is completely accurate, is that you either get photos or videos and there's narration from Julian and if you make a bid on it you might be the only one that gets these videos or whatever he's doing visually I think or that's the wise. idea there's there's one one each. person gets it so it will be a rarity to itself that Julian is involved with it and that he's doing narration for it 
Yeah, although personally, I'll take the coat itself <laughs> or the <laughs> Hey Jude, uh, you know, directions and, yeah. and all those other things. I, I don't know. It's, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to see what one of these things is like, but um, I personally, and this could just be because um, I'm now, you know, a geezer, but uh, <laughs> I don't get it. You know, I don't get it. It's, it reminds me of, um, you know, back in the cassette days, a friend of mine, mentioned that having a rare record having a tape of a rare record is like kissing your sister you know it's not really having the rare record it's having a tape of a real record and this is having a digital film or picture or whatever of a rare thing that you still don't have right you know i don't know so i, I don't i don't see I, it so what you're saying is i could take a, this right here I could take a still photo, right, mm. and na- put a narration on it. This is Darren DeVivo's head. All right, and it's a it's a it's a non fungus, and I could <laughs> non fungible <laughs> head, <laughs> and I could I could get thousands of dollars for that. Mm. Is that what you're saying? Seemingly. Something like that. It's it, maybe it's also like if it was a photo and it's personalized by the artist, then that makes it even more special. You know, the non-fungible part of it, to me, suggests that there is something um, about it that makes it not copyable or tradable or, well, you could probably trade it, but, uh, but, but there's one of them and that's all there is. And um, I, I, you know, I don't know how they can make them non-copyable because anything that exists can be copied, but I don't know. I really don't know. I've never seen one of these things. I'd like to see it and get to understand it more before, um, you know, further making a fool of myself about what it is mm. and what it isn't. But all I know is you're not going to get the coat or the guitars or the Hey Jude, um, you know, notes right. or any of that stuff. You're going to get a representation of it. Okay. I think I'm going to start buying things with imaginary money. I'll invent my own currency hmm. here. Here, well, you're Thank you're you. edging into you're edging into early John and Yoko territory. That's right. You know, I'll bang in an imaginary He's... nail for an imaginary oh, five I'm shilling. Right hey. back around the next <laughs> show. I'm going to do inside a bag. <laughs> anyway, well, this I'm... seems to be the modern way <laughs> of uh, of doing things, I guess, but. Uh, I'm just reporting it so you guys watching know about this. The question One last... is non fungible, what cryptocurrency core a Apple? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are not going to know what we're talking about here. Anyway, last news item there is a new book uh, released just now from Tommy Hanley, the photographer. It's called With a Little Help from My Lens my time with the Beatles. Tommy is considered one of the great music photographers of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The new book tells the story of Tommy's remarkable close friendship with the Beatles. It chronicles his time with the Fabs beginning in 1963 through the end of the decade when Tommy found himself at the epicenter of the eccentricity of the Apple empire. Tommy also shares his experiences in the 80s when he was appointed as archivist by Apple Corps to assist in tracking down photographs and memorabilia for the Beatles anthology. There will be a trade version of this book and a limited edition one of just a thousand copies. The trade version will have less content. This is all according to uh, the publisher and thanks to John Bazzini from the Beatles in print together and solo Facebook page for that. Um, and you can also visit Tommy's on website for more information, TommyHanley.com, H-A-N-L-E-Y. All right. And that's all the news I have for you. That's it? It's plenty right there, I think. I was hoping that my copy, because I, I purchased the Mary Hopkin album, and I was hoping it came before we filmed the show today. Mm. Um, but I did reach out uh, to Jessica, who is the daughter of Mary Hopkin and Tony Visconti uh, and a, a singer songwriter in her own right. And uh, she said that her mom doesn't really do uh, interviews anymore. Um, you know, cause we did kind of think it would be fun to have her on the show, but 
I told her we're fans. Tell your mom we're fans here and can't wait to hear pieces uh, yep. of the new album. And she's actually got a bunch of things that she's released in recent years. If you go digging around on her website. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and it's all really good stuff. Oh, I love her voice. Yeah. I mean, it was so suitable for folk music, which really was her love. Right. She didn't really want to do what Paul had her do, kind of show tunes um, on the first album, Postcard. And if you follow what she did after that, that's more in line with what she wanted to do. Right. The other Apple album, Earth Song, Ocean Song, is stunning. It's gorgeous. Mm. Uh, the stuff yeah. that she does on that album. So you should check that out and her other work too. But I've also known for quite a while that she's a, pretty private person she rarely gives interviews right well on to the topic of the show today and that is the yellow submarine album released in january 1969 uh for obvious reasons yellow submarine's not considered a major work in the beatles album discography um but with all the attention these days on and rightly so the get back sessions uh, which took place in January 1969. I thought it was fascinating to think that in the middle of all of this, and it was probably not a big deal uh, in house, uh, maybe for some folks at Apple it was, the Beatles released an album, Yellow Submarine. Uh, the Beatles didn't, Apple did. And it came out during that time uh, that the Get Back sessions were taking place. Um, and of course, we all know that it's uh, kind of a half a Beatles album, sort of like The Way a Hard Day's Night and Help appeared as soundtracks in the United States. Half the material, roughly, were Beatles songs from the film. The other half were instrumentals from the score of uh, the respective films. And that's what Yellow Submarine was, except that they were divided where you had the Beatles songs on side one and George Martin songs on side two. Um, and then you take the six Beatles songs, only four of them were new, uh, except in England where, um, all you need is love was appearing on album for the first time because magical mystery tour wasn't an album in the UK. So, uh, so in the UK, there were five non-album tracks, four of them new appearing on Yellow Submarine. But I just thought it would be interesting to spend a few minutes talking about this album, which does get brushed under the rug because it was released in between the white album and Abbey road and uh, the album hit stores at the same time as the get back sessions were taking place. And we've uh, been enjoying those in recent months. So um, I have some fond memories of yellow submarine because it was one of the first Beatles albums I owned um, after uh, the Hey Jude collection and Abbey road and let it be. I vaguely remember it being a gift, a present from my folks after I had my tonsils removed. <laughs> and I think that was in 1972, uh, making me seven years old. And to this day, again, which I always love to hark back to this on this show, you know, the memories come flooding back when I hear certain Beatle albums, certain songs, see certain album covers. And Yellow Submarine always uh, had a very special place in my heart. I love George Martin's um, um, it's George Martin's material on side two. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, you know, pick your brains and get your feelings for Yellow Submarine, maybe your initial impressions when you first became aware of the album or when it first came out. I don't know, Ken, you probably don't remember when it was released. Alan might. Um, you know, some thoughts on the Yellow Submarine album. Uh, start with Alan. Um, I have only vague memories of it. And for some reason, I associate it more with the White Album than with Let It Be. Uh, well, of course, Let It Be was just being recorded then. We didn't have it yet. Um, it, it sort of came out like way after the film. And, you know, I remember we, you know, we knew the, we knew those three of the four songs because we didn't really know Hey Bulldog because it wasn't in the U.S. version of the film. Um, but, uh, you know, so that in a way, that itself was probably a draw to the album because there was a Beatles song on there that we hadn't heard in any form. 
Um, I, for some reason, I vague, my, my vague memory is telling me that uh, the first time I heard it was on a friend's cassette. Um, and it, I think it probably didn't get onto my must buy list for some time because it was only, you know, basically four new songs. Um, and um, I like the George Martin stuff too, but I'm not sure I, uh, back in those days, I even listened to it, you know? Um, uh, I probably thought it was a great idea to have it all on one side because um, having gone through all those years with Hard Day's Night and Help, taking the needle up and putting it onto the next Beatle track and then the next Beatle track and skipping the orchestral stuff, um, unless I was, too lazy and that's how I got to hear those things um I shouldn't admit this as a classical guy um <laughs> but still you know I belatedly came to the George Martin stuff and listened to it and 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 I really think it's good stuff uh you know it's not the Beatles um but it definitely is redolent of Yellow Submarine I mean you you put on the record you can you you remember you know where they were in the film as because he was a he was you know he was a very decent composer and uh you know it's well done uh but yeah I I, I thought of it as kind of minor as well uh and uh, and uh, you know didn't invest a whole lot of um you know emotional uh you know anything in the Yellow Submarine album as such. It was just one other thing that you had to get if you wanted the full run. That was the way okay. I looked at it. Yeah, okay. I can. Um, pretty close to what Alan was saying. I mean, I don't remember the moment when I first bought the record, but I'm sure it was pretty close to when it first came out. And I wanted to hear the songs as I heard them in the movie since I did see the movie at the time. Um, but because of the fact that there wasn't that much Beatles material and you even had two songs, Yellow Submarine and All You Need Is Love, that were already out anyway, um, to get just four songs, it, you know, you wait for those four songs and that's it. And admittedly, in the very beginning, I didn't listen all that much to the George Martin music. As time went on, especially as I watched the film more and I grew to appreciate George Martin's music and how it was placed and how it worked so well and all the scenes where it was used, I grew to appreciate it. I mean, Pepperland to me is a classic. It's such an incredible piece of music. Mm -hmm. And um, I've grown to really like that, but I have to be in the mood to just set myself aside and listen to one whole side of George Martin music still to this day. But um, yeah, I mean, when you look at Beatles albums, if you consider this a real album, um they would have to be you know towards the bottom of the list there because of the fact that you only have at the time what was for new Beatles songs for unreleased Beatles songs not brand new Beatles songs because some of them were recorded in 67 mm -hmm. so um but we didn't know that then but to to go to the movie theater and and to watch the film and I loved the the film as a child and especially thinking of All Together Now being used twice in the movie. And at the very end, I'm waiting to get a copy of All Together Now. And that was exciting for me. And, um, but still, the main attraction are those four unreleased Beatles songs. And um, that's basically it. Uh, I actually enjoyed <laughs> when it came to the American soundtracks for A Hard Day's Night and Help listening to the other stuff too. Mm -hmm. The George Martin music on yeah. A Hard Day's Night and the Ken Thorne music and, and Help. I didn't pick up the needle like Alan did. I kind of listened to the whole thing. It made me anticipate the Beatles stuff more. Mm -hmm. oh. It's funny, again, when, when you're young and things, when you're, when you're young, make such an impression on you. Mm. Um, I still hear Help and I hear A Hard Day's Night the way they were in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And... I never remember ever feeling cheated or feeling like, oh, you know, I don't want to listen to that album because you have to go through all this instrumental music. Um, I, I, I loved it. And, and again, I got George, I, I got, <laughs> I got Yellow Submarine when I was very young and the whole thing had a right down to the extra glossy Apple label for some reason that always stuck out at me. The label seemed a little shinier than, uh, 
some of the other Beatle albums I had. Uh, it just resonated with me as a little kid. But today I look at it and like, okay, um, as far as the Beatles were concerned, uh, the follow-up to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is the White Album. Because they didn't intend the Magical Mystery Tour to be an album. And it wasn't in the UK back in the day, which meant there's a year and a half gap, uh, which was a long time back in uh, back in the late 60s, a year and a half gap between Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band and the White Album. Uh, again, a gap we didn't have to deal with in the U.S. because Magical Mystery Tour was right in the middle of that. Mm. So a year and a half goes by between Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, and then it's only a month and a half, and another album is out, Yellow Submarine, and... Fans didn't really know it at the time. They were conducting the Get Back sessions with plans of another album coming out. Mm -hmm. And all of this happening uh, without bringing up the fact that the White Album is a 30-song, 92, 93-minute long album. And these guys are already cooking up the next album and throwing soundtrack albums out there. Uh, I just thought it was a a few little interesting points uh, that I wanted to bring out and talk about an album that does, in fact, get lost in the shuffle, and that's Yellow Submarine. But uh, it did get a, uh, a redo uh, many years later when the song track came out. And Alan pointed out when we were discussing this show or the possibilities of talking about Yellow Submarine, um, and... It was the case. It was the first time Beatle music had been remixed. Um, so uh, if I'm, I believe that's the case. Uh, it was the yeah. first time there was a, a remix, be, remix being done. And yeah, yeah. here was a, a, a all in one place, all of the songs from the film on one album. And it still turned out to be a bit of a short album. Mm-hmm. Um, and to go with the, uh, uh, the big reissue of the movie on DVD for the first time uh, and, uh, and VHS. Uh, so the song track, I mean, were you guys, emb- did you guys embrace the song track right away hearing these new mixes or were your initial impressions <clears throat> that of a purist saying, I'd rather they not play with the mixes of the original songs, the original mixes of the songs? You know, it's only surprisingly in recent years that I pay attention to different mixes. You know, to me, this was more, hey, you got 15 songs on one album. It's all the songs that were in the movie. It even has Think for Yourself in there. They only had a snippet of that in the movie. Mm -hmm. So I just like the idea that for people who found it upsetting that Yellow Submarine, the album, only had one side of Beatles and two songs that were already released. Um, for those people, it's nice to have it all in one package. Later on, I like to discover different mixes, and I liked, and I don't know all the differences in each of the songs here. I can pinpoint a few of them, but I really like the sound quality of what they put on on the song track. Um, I might have, before I heard it, um, sort of had some reservations about remixing and and all of that. I mean, I was very used to the original Beatles mixes as they were, but when it came, um, I immediately took the disc and my CD Walkman and went to work and on the way to work, listened to it. And I remember Nowhere Man coming on. Mm. And now Nowhere Man, I mean, I'd, I'd listened to all of the Beatles stuff a gazillion times on headphones for all kinds of reasons. Um, and so I knew where everything was. And on the original mix of Nowhere Man, you have basically the vocals all on one side. And then the instrumental comes in on the other side. And uh, it's, you know, it never bothered me, um, but that's the way it was. I'm sitting on the subway in my headphones on the way to work and nowhere man comes on and the vocals are all around you, you know, and I just thought, wow. Okay. That, that first 10 seconds completely changed my attitude towards remixes. Cause I thought, you know, I mean, 
I love the original mix because it's the original mix and I've always heard it and never had a problem with it and, you know, all of that. But if this is what you can do remixing, um, there's something to it. Um, and then I, I did a piece about the reissue of the film um, because it was also coming out in 5.1 for the first time um, and the CD. Uh, and in the course of that, I interviewed Peter Cobbin, who did the remixes. Um, and we had a really interesting conversation, which is, uh, you know, when I found out that, you know, all, not only had all of the Beatles master tapes been digitally transferred, but that they had all of the components of things that were originally mixed down along the way, like in making Pepper, you know, they had four tracks, they did an intermediate mix and, you know, to make some space for adding other tracks and all that, but they kept all those tapes. And so when they transferred it digitally, they were able to sync them all up so that a lot of those things that had been mixed together, we now had in their raw form and it could be remixed. I found that really exciting news. Um, and we benefited from that in, you know, all of these reissue box sets, you know, the fact that they could now, they didn't have to just remaster the mixed tape because it was too complicated and there was no way to get to the individual tracks. Now you can get to the individual tracks. You could even rethink what was going on. Um, and so, you know, you had that difference with Nowhere Man. You had that with a lot of things. Um, another thing that struck me and I asked Peter Cobbin about was Yellow Submarine. Uh, when John's repeated lines of Ringo's come in, you know, as, as you know, on the stereo one, he comes right in, uh, you know, after the, I think, second line. Um, stereo mix, he's he comes in later, you miss a line or two before they finally bring him back. And Peter Cobbin in his new stereo mix brought John back as it was. And, and he said, well, you know, I always had noticed that, that there was that disparity. And I thought that, you know, we should bring John back this time, uh, you know, in time rather than too late. And um, because that was the way the single was and it was a hit and all that. And, and I said, well, okay, but in that case, the mono yellow submarine begins with a guitar chord under in the town and mm. the stereo one doesn't, it's just Ringo's voice, you know, in the, and, and then they come in on town. And I said, so why didn't you bring back that chord? And he said, well, you know, basically in the end I had to, I, I wanted to go with what people remembered and I wanted John to come back in time, but people basically these days remember mostly the stereo mix and I didn't want it to start out so different from what they remembered. Um, I didn't put the chord in there, you know? Um, but yeah, there were, you know, there were other things too. I mean, we, we talked also about it's all too much because it's all too much is a, a bit of a, a problem in a way. Um, the original, version which is out on bootleg goes for eight some odd minutes um this only goes for like six minutes it, basically what he did is he recreated the version that's on the album and what they had done on the album is they cut out one of the verses to make right. it shorter mm -hmm. the thing is that the verse they cut out is in the film so right. i kind of think that he should have given us the whole version there but you know he didn't. Um, they wanted him to do it pretty much as the songs were, not give us any, uh, you know, special extras that we didn't already have. Uh, but I, I thought he did a really good job. Um, people have complained about Eleanor Rigby not being in sync, and I've never heard that. I've, I listened to it again this morning. It's in sync. And not only that, at the time, Paul McCartney commented about it and said, you know, it really makes you feel as if the strings are now all around you. Mm -hmm. um, and you kind of think that if it was not in sync, Paul McCartney would have heard that. He has mm -hmm. good ear, mm -hmm. you know? Um, <clears throat> but the other thing about that mix is, you know, if you, you may remember on the original stereo mix, uh, 
you know, ah, oh, look at all the lonely people. And then as it goes to the solo vocal, you know, Ellen or Rigby, that starts in the middle and moves very quickly to one side. You know, it's as if they couldn't fade it in time, you know, away from the, the, the group vocal, put the solo vocal on one side. So that always on headphones seemed a little weird to me because it's like, you know, oh, it all, we people right in the middle in a drill and a rig bit, <laughs> sort mm. of in the middle of the first syllable of Eleanor, it's heading off to one side and this corrects it. So I thought that was, uh, I thought that was a good move too. I really loved this album when it came out, you know, even though, you know, nothing new, all old songs, all familiar songs, but it just sounded so great. And um, I think really for me, the bottom line of all that was Nowhere Man, you know, just listen to that Nowhere Man with headphones, incredible. That's yeah, I'd, say. <laughs> I'd like to echo Alan's sentiments there. I mean, Nowhere Man is just so noticeable from the very start where you, you hear all the harmonies right in your face. And one of the few things that I haven't been crazy about, not just with Beatles music, but any music where lead vocals are in one channel, I'm not a fan of that. I'd much rather lead vocals be centered and even background vocals, you know, and um, Nowhere Man has such a fuller sound. Now you could take Nowhere Man and listen to the mono version if you want all those vocals to hit you all at once in both the left and right you know <laughs> yeah uh, but it's but it's so much fuller a sound and stereo and also the same thing like you were saying with Eleanor Rigby Paul's lead vocal becomes and goes in one channel here it's centered throughout the whole uh mix of the mm -hmm. new version um only a northern song is supposed to be the first time that that version came out in real stereo it was like a right. you know fold down st uh, stereo mm -hmm. um although the version that came out on the beatles anthology volume two which came out before the yellow submarine song track was taking some of the same basic tracks and editing together two different takes and it even had different vocals and different lyrics from george harrison and that was in stereo but if you're going back to the original only a northern song as it appeared on the original Yellow Submarine album, this was the first time that version was released in true stereo. Right. So um, it's a great experience to listen to. Every now and then you should go back and listen to the song track because it really was mixed very well and has a very full, clean sound. Um, yeah, pretty much everything Alan said. <laughs> you know, I asked Peter Cobbin, who, by the way, um, in, in the small world, um, category peter cobbin did the mixes for the lord of the rings films um oh. so he knows our pal peter jackson <laughs> uh or at least has worked for him one way or another uh and uh he did the 5.1 mix for yellow submarine as well which was he did them as separate mixes um and I think he said he did the stereo mixes first because he didn't want the 5.1 mixes just to be folded down. He wanted to make sure that they had distinct mixes. But I asked which was the most problematic of the tracks to remix. And he said only a Northern song. Um, and I can read you his answer if you know about why. Uh, <clears throat> yes. And I said, yeah, that one was only in, in mono. And I think the problem was that some of the effects were added during the mono mix. And he said, well, I'm fairly sure, we'll never know for certain, but I think I hit upon the reason it was only mixed in mono. I think it may have been attempted in stereo some years later, but it never worked because the song itself, unlike the process I just described where one tape may have, may have been bounced to another, that was when we were talking about the, you know, the digital right. going back and um, that was never done. Instead, they were attempting a crude form of synchronization where they started two machines and ran them at the same time. So it may have worked when they made the mix, but when they try it later for stereo, they couldn't get it to sync in the same manner. There were a lot of effects, tape delayed, glock and spiel and trumpet. So it meant syncing two machines very precisely. And that had only been done once when the mono mix was made. 
So it was really the new technology that, you know, digital technology that allowed them to do that syncing of all the tracks on there, because apparently the master is really two separate masters, two machines needed to be synced. Yeah. See, I'm glad I brought it up. (laughs) It's a good idea, Darren. There aren't all that many in here, but every <laughs> once in a while, a good one will fall out. I, I just thought it would be interesting to look at an album that we probably won't do. You know, we wouldn't normally ever think to like focus on Yellow Submarine. Right. Uh, but at this point, the album was released 53 years ago. Now, last month uh, was hitting stores as the Beatles were in this Apple Studios and Twickenham Studios. Uh, the get back sessions going on. We've been concentrating on that, of course, deservedly so. But this little old Beatle album was popping out in stores at the same time. So I thought, let's let's spend a little time with Yellow Submarine. <clears throat> it's also kind of interesting that um, the original Yellow Submarine album, well, the 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 film first came out in the UK in July of '68, but it wasn't until November that we got it in the US. Mm -hmm. And I would also advise everyone watching, we did a really good interview with Dr. Bob Hieronymus and Laura Mm -hmm. Kortner about the Yellow Submarine film. I just did two interviews about Yellow Submarine with Dr. Bob and Laura, and also another one with um, Bruce Spizer and Al Sussman. So there's a lot of information you can get about the film and the album there, but it's kind of interesting that- Yes, thank you. His book thank is you, his book combines Yellow Submarine and Magical Mystery Tour. That's Bruce's new book, right? The latest yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I, I still have to get my copy. Anyway. So you get Yellow Submarine on the inside. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know a lot of people have written to me asking why was there this delay for the film between the UK release and the US release, and according to Dr. Bob and Laura, they were saying that it all had to do with Hey Bulldog. And that the animators of the film felt that it didn't fit well with the film and that it didn't look as professional um, as the rest of the film. Um, Kind of amateurish, kind of almost like the Beatle cartoons that were on television, closer Mm -hmm. in style to that. So they had to take that out, which is why we didn't have it when it first came out here. Mm -hmm. So... The, the movie comes out here in the U.S. in November and the White Album comes out in November. And could be why I associate Yellow Submarine. And the White Album. <laughs> <laughs> what a time to be a Beatle fan, November of 1968 for, for yeah, those really. two reasons. And they didn't want both albums coming out at the same time. So they delayed Yellow Submarine to January of 69. But even still, you're talking about like six weeks apart between the White Album and Yellow Submarine. And there was actually one week, March 1st of 1969, when the top two albums in the US, number one was the White Album, number two was Yellow Submarine. But um, it's kind of interesting, you know, the, the movie had to be delayed here. And also George Martin had to re-record his stuff. That's right. He did. He, he yeah. did several recordings, which happened after the movie came out in the UK. Mm-hmm. The stuff that you hear on the Yellow Submarine album that George Martin did was all done after the movie came out in the UK. Mm-hmm. That's right. I that was recut. That was yeah. all redone there. And, um, and then there was also talk about, because the Beatles were always you know, saying they want to give you as much value um, to the fans as possible, to get a new album and only get four new songs, there was talk about there being an EP being released. And there was going to be a five song EP with those four songs from Yellow Submarine plus Across the Universe. Hmm. Um, and I talked to Bruce Spizer and Al Sussman about this, and it didn't come out for a couple of reasons. In the UK, EPs were selling less and less, getting less popular. So I think they even did away with their EP charts. Although Magical Mystery Tour did very well, in general, you weren't seeing EPs getting released towards the end of the 60s. Um, And by the time that they would have put out the EP, which would have been, I believe, March or April of 69, 
the album was already out anyway. So what would have been the point of getting the EP if some right. of the fans already bought the album? Mm -hmm. So a bit of a, a mess there. But um, Across the Universe is one of those songs that's floated around with all these different versions. And it could have also have been part of this EP instead of being on the World Wildlife version. So Interesting that that Parlophone did Magical Mystery Tour as an EP. Mm -hmm. But slightly more than a year later, the EP was deemed as, I guess, the way not to go. And there was no Yellow Submarine EP because that would, if there was an EP meant to happen, it was Yellow Submarine. Um, so I, th I think uh, Bruce also talks about the problem created by um, It's All Too Much mm -hmm. um, being, you know, over you know, six and a half minutes um, and an EP being really a 45. I mean, Hey Jude is longer than that and it fit on a 45, but here you have four songs that you need to get on an EP and it's all too much would have taken one whole side by itself. Um, if you added any of the other songs to it, it would have made it a little too long um, and you'd lose fidelity and uh, you could do it at 33, but they didn't want to do that. Um, so because that song is so long, uh, you know, you couldn't, you also couldn't have all three of the other songs on one side because that, that was too much. So that song kind of sort of made an EP kind of an impossibility in a way, mm. or, or it made it difficult. Um, so but I then why, that, why talk about Across the Universe adding that in addition? <laughs> yeah, because it would have had to have been a double EP, probably yes, like Magical was, Mystery. Tour. Yeah. And then if you're going to do a double EP, um, theoretically being released after the album for people who didn't want to buy a full album, um, you know, basically you're, you're releasing the EP as a, a cost saving measure in a way. But if it's a double EP, it's no longer much of a cost saving measure, mm. you know, so it's a problem. Anyway, <laughs> they didn't do it. So there you go. Mm -hmm. uh, one other little uh, out of left field thing. I don't know if anyone else is aware of this. Um, and I don't even know why I bought it. There was a method to my madness at the time, but um, probably in the probably the 80s or so or the early 90s, I bought Yellow Submarine for some reason on cassette. Um, pr probably could have been just to have it for the car. Mm -hmm. And the cassette had Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds opening really? side too, which was probably done for t timing purposes. Uh, I don't know if all cassettes, uh, cassette, pre cassette copies of Yellow Submarine going back to day one always had uh, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds on it, but at least one of the later issues uh, included it at the beginning. It's kind of weird to have it there, but I, I may still have my tape. I wasn't aware of that. Look, I got to look to see if I still have it. The yellow, uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, starting side two of uh, Yellow Submarine on cassette. Speaking of Lucy, um, in this version, um, he gets a lot closer to the mono sound of Lucy than the stereo original. Um, you know, uh, in, in that song during um, the bridge, um, you know, newspaper taxis, uh, you've got basically uh, John's voice followed by a, a guitar, you know, it's, it's sort of playing along with him and it gives it a kind of very spacey, um, you know, what at the time struck us as a psychedelic effect. It's like, you know, in, in stereo, that effect is greatly lessened but it's there in mono. And so I listened to this again this morning and um, it was really much closer to the kind of mono feel, but still in stereo. So that was something else I think he went for. Just since you mentioned Lucy, I thought I'd uh, point that out too. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I enjoy talking about Yellow Submarine. <laughs> Um, so there's Yellow Submarine for you. Uh, uh, things uh, we said today style. 
Um, so I guess that's it for this one, for this show. So let's go around the horn and uh, uh, give out our personal information, um, starting with Ken. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with me, you can email me directly at everylittlething at att.net. And uh, I do advise all of you, if you can, to check out my own personal YouTube channel, which is all Beatle Conversations. I just had uh, an interview with Owen Lynn, who has been uh, on my channel two other times. He is a rock journalist from Ireland. And um, we talked about George Harrison's Dark Horse album, and he reviewed it in that show. We also had Sam Wiles on. Uh, Sam is the host of the Paul McCartney uh, podcast Paul or Nothing, and we did an entire show on the bonus tracks from Off the Ground. Only those, because <laughs> we already did two other shows: one on side one of Off the Ground, the other side two of Off the Ground. We had to finish it up, and uh, just going through every single bonus track from Off the Ground, which was, you know, a fantastic time to be a McCartney fan with all this bonus material from CD singles that came out. I also. Um, had a show on with Joe Mayo, who uh, has his own Mean Mr. Mayo channel. He's also part of the Talk More Talk uh, podcast show that I do on the Solo Beatles. Joe is joined by Dave Ghosty Wills from WFDU and uh, Nashville musician Dylan Seavey, who plays the drums. And we did an entire conversation on whether or not we, we felt that the Beatles at any time, deep down in our heart of hearts, would have ever all four of them reunited in any capacity for a song, album, uh, concert, or tour. We did a full discussion on that. So those are some of the new ones that I have on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. And if you can, please subscribe to that. My other podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. Uh, the next show will be next Monday, which is February the 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel. And uh, since we're very close to Valentine's Day, we're going to pick our top three uh, favorite love songs from each of the four Beatles in their solo careers. We just did a show on our favorite solo Beatle videos of the 70s. You might want to check out for that. And then there's my website, which is KenMichaelsRadio.com. And be sure to uh, check out all the audio interviews that I have on there. There's loads of them from the last gosh 10 years i've just been adding uh, interviews on there those are strictly audio plus weekly beatles trivia where you can win one of 10 great prizes every week like books cds dvds vinyl you name it that's all on my website okay i think that covers everything all right alan Okay. Um, easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, either um, at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Remixed is a little more skewed towards Beatles stuff, and Alan Cozen without Remixed is more other stuff, but there's, you know, interplay. Um, we also have two Facebook pages for the show one is just called things we said today and one is called things we said today beatles radio fans um shows get posted on both uh we also have a twitter feed at things we said fab um and you can contact us by email which people have been increasingly doing and it's really interesting um uh, you can send us an email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Um, and we may respond directly. We may respond on the show. Um, feel free to send us ideas, um, complaints, anything you feel like sending us, um, we will field. And um, but make yeah, sure you know, not, you can, hmm? if you send us something, make sure it's non fungible. <laughs> <laughs> fungible. yes send us non-fungible stuff that's what we want yes um <clears throat> uh yeah so uh the shows you know where to get the shows i mean in, in a way for us uh, the primary thing at the moment is youtube because it's got the video version of the show um and uh that way you can see me holding up a cd 
Um, otherwise, you know, we, the audio version is on Podbean and on iTunes and various other places where, oh, not to mention you got to see the swag from the IMAX showing, which I'd never seen before. So that's why I watched the video one. <laughs> anyway, so over to you, Darren. All right. Um, what? Oh, right, our contact information. You could, if you want to email me directly and we could talk about Alan and Ken behind their backs, you could email me at DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, if you do happen to do that way, you know, of course, I'll share. I share with uh, Alan and, and uh, Ken. Uh, if you want to tune in, listen to WFUV. It's 90.7 FM in New York City, in the New York metro area, um, 90.7 FM. You can stream us at WFUV.org, and we have an app. That's a great thing to do. Download that, listen to us on the app, and you can ask your smart speaker to play WFUV. I can be heard Monday through Thursday nights uh, starting at 10 p.m. and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, and also the Facebook pages. I have two pages. Uh, they sort of mirror each other. Uh, one is a little more personal stuff. Uh, and the other is all music and maybe some thoughts on local sports teams that I root for. Um, just search Darren DeVivo. You'll find both pages and uh, we'll be connected. And uh, I'll be very happy. I don't know if you'll be happy, but I'll be very happy to have you on board. And that's basically it for this edition of Things We Said Today. Uh, so for Ken Michaels, for Alan Cozen, I'm Darren DeVivo. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.